discipleship cruise. God bless you. Let us pray together as I trust that we gather your family around and your friends and your materials for hearing the word of God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for a time like this again. We pray that you will maximize for us this half hour. We are praying that light will come, understanding will come, and that grace will be enough. Thank you. Open our eyes to behold wondrous things out of your word in Jesus' name. Amen. Bless God for you. I trust God that you are doing well. Our program is quite brief. And I have said I wished we can have a face-to-face -face contact, but we, we can't. Uh, except you come around or we meet somewhere. But I trust God that God is blessing you. Times are hard. Times are very difficult. Times are very traumatic. Um, but it's not, it's not you alone. It's everybody. And it is only when pressure comes that we know those who are who. There are men, there are boys. But when pressure comes, we know those who are who. I want to um, say that I'm honestly quite distressed because of the condition of, uh, of electricity lights in our environment where this program is supposed to be reaching you. I understand and I know from my own house that it's so difficult to get light um, when you need it. Actually, it's becoming worse than before. But we're going to be praying about it, that God, if for nothing else, for the, because of the word of God's sake, that God, please give us light. Many of you have become handicapped and you are, you are losing several programs. Please, again, uh, you can go to our office and you can pick up the CDs and listen to them privately. Secondly, um, we are not able to be taking questions. We are trying to do a series on Enjoy Your Bible. And um, it's, a, it's a cumulative, progressive series. We started from the Genesis, the book of beginnings, which is a miniature of the whole Bible. And um, I, I think you should get that series. Um, in the meantime, um, please, um, if you have questions, if you have um, needs, you have anything we could do for you, please, we are um, willing. And as God gives us grace, we will do our best. So don't um, just listen to the word of God, respond to it. And if that response means you have to come to us, uh, we are going to be certainly ready to do whatsoever that God will enable us to do for you by his grace. Uh, even today, uh, even though we have passed that stage, I would like to take one question that has come to us. I uh, know many of you have different kinds of questions. There's one question I have here. Say, man of God, I need your help. Please, how can I choose my husband? Because I am confused. Am I free to marry any man? who got a baby from another woman, I am trusting that God will help, you, help me through you. I, I think I want to answer this very quickly. Um, and there are several other questions that may be on your heart that you've not asked. We need to have them. Um, one of God, I need your help. How can I choose my husband? A woman does not choose her husband. Uh, let it be categorical. Is a man that chooses who to marry. When you say choose, unless you are saying, how can I know who my husband will be? Naturally, and as the Bible made it, the man was made first before the woman. And it is the man that goes to look for a helper. God said to him, I will make for you a helper, but it is the man's duty to go and get that helper. God will not choose for you. God will not force you. God knows the person. If you seek God's face, God will show you the person. But every man has to choose his wife. And naturally, and in God's mind, the woman is not the one to choose. But she will choose in the sense that she must give an answer when the man comes around uh, to ask her. So in that sense, okay, if, if that's what you mean, somebody has asked your hand in marriage, then, then I will expect that you should go and pray. And after you have prayed, and God has given you an answer from himself, 
then you can give that man an answer of peace. You can you should tell him exactly what you are led to tell him. And it's only when you have said yes that courtship can start and the journey towards marriage can begin. There must be an offer, there must be an acceptance, there must be a proposal, there must be an acceptance. It's not done by proxy. Do it well. You say, I'm, am I free? And so, sister, don't be confused. Am I free to marry any man who got a baby from another woman? We are not free to marry any man. You are free to marry only the choice of God. Now, particularly if a man has got a child from some other woman, you can still marry him if it, if it is the will of God. But be it known to you that there are consequences for that kind of relationship and marriage. The trouble is that once you marry a man with a child, you already have a child. And you cannot treat that child as a second class citizen. Actually, if, it's a, if, if that child is your first child, your husband got that child out of marriage. Well, the days of ignorance, if he has repented, God has forgiven him. But there are consequences. One consequence is that that child becomes your first child. This is very difficult for women. They want a child from their womb to inherit the, the family. They want a child from their womb. And of course, there's a natural attachment between a natural child and a mother, especially when it's a boy. So, if you will not be able to give this child uh, the first place, you have so 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 such a marriage is not simple. It's not just between you and the man. It is between you and the man and his children. Same for a widow. So same for someone who wants want to marry a widower. Once somebody has already had a child, or somebody has married before, and you want to marry that person, of course you can marry you can marry a divorcee. But somebody whose husband died, you could marry somebody whose husband died, because uh, death separates marriage. But then you the, the, you have to marry that person, and in in the consideration of all the people around it. Because you, are, you become the mother of those children, and they become your, you become their mother, they become your, they, be, they call you mommy, you are their stepmother. And if you are very good, it could work very well. But you cannot just marry anybody. I think you should pray. I hope you are born again. I hope you are spiritual. I hope you can hear God. I hope, I hope, I hope, because you could live ever after marriage unhappily. If you didn't put God first. If you didn't put God first, then after your marriage, your situation could get worse than before you married. Marriage is supposed to enhance. In the purpose of God, marriage should enhance and enlarge and lift up a man. But when you don't pray and you make a choice by yourself, then the consequences can be very dire. So please, don't rush. Don't go into this without taking counsel. Don't go in unadvisedly. And please do a courtship so that within the courtship you can test your convictions again. Let nobody deceive you. A happy marriage is a sine qua non to a very good life and to serving God. An unhappy marriage is a disaster. It's it makes a man to become, it sets a man back. Actually, it can put you under terrible hypertension. It can make you terribly unhappy. So that's why you don't rush at that point. Because that is where the devil waits for several brilliant people to, to destroy them. As several men who could have become giants for God, they have become, they have become dwarfs because of marriage. But the Lord will deliver you from the hand of this particular enemy if it's an enemy, that God may serve you without fear. You must enjoy marriage, not endure it. You must receive a help from God, not a trouble. A woman is either a trouble or a help. And when you get a help from God, it is superlatively, superlatively excellently wonderful. But when you marry a trouble, oh my God, uh, your life will be full of regret. So at this juncture, 
when a person wants to go into marriage, they shouldn't rush. Now, I've left chapter 2. Actually, I went back a little bit now. We have already entered chapter 3, and we have begun to see that swamp personality has been roving around from since chapter 2. It was not in chapter 2 because God didn't want to show it to us yet. But from chapter 3, there, there became a revelation of the serpent or Satan who embodies human beings or animals or whatever to do his wicked work. There are two kingdoms, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of, 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 of the devil, the power of darkness. And everybody who is in the kingdom of God is opposed. There is a consistent, constant warfare. If you are not aware of this, you are not aware of it at your own peril. As Adam and Eve were having a wonderful time in the Garden of Eden, this personality came around and caused a serious trouble. What we have now known, what we now call the fall of man. It is, cata it is catastrophic. That's what has put us in this terrible situation in which we have found ourselves. If you extract properly, you know that man is in a deep danger. Every man born by woman is in a deep danger. Unless Jesus recovers you from the fall. The fall is so deep where we fell from, where we fell from, and where we fell into is so deep. And only God can pull you out of that merry clay. Oh, many people have plenty of money, but they are in deep distress, deep trouble. It's not, money does not solve the problem. Actually, nothing has solved the problem of the fall of man except the Lord Jesus. Once man fell, we began to see a catalog of terrible things. Those people that were naked before, and they didn't, they were not ashamed, their eyes suddenly opened. They began to cover up one from another. And we began to see the principles of the flesh, the principles of the human nature. We saw the divorce, as we read, as we saw last time. That man began to say to God, the woman you gave to be with me, that's a divorce. That's not what he said in Genesis. In Genesis he said, this woman is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Now he said, the woman you gave to be with me, Ah, it was terrible. It was terrible. Then we saw him beginning to accuse his wife. The woman you gave to be with me. And we said, already began to see principles. Principles of the fall. Principles of the human nature. Principles of selfishness. Where a man is accusing his wife. That's that she's the reason why everything went wrong with him. And when... Adam could not answer God because God is saying, where are you? Where are you, Adam? I used to come and have fellowship with you. Number one, fellowship has finished. Say, are you, I'm hiding behind the trees because I heard your voice. Where are you? I'm becoming secretive. I'm becoming no longer transparent. I can't stand in the presence of light. Something happened to me. I disobeyed you. God said, please, what happened? Who is speaking to you now? He said, the woman you gave to be with me. God regretted. God was, God was not happy. If he had said, Lord, I am sorry, that would have been the end. God didn't ask the woman. The woman is not the head. It was a man that God asked. God will never ask your wife what she did when you are in the house. God expects that every man should be the head. Every man should take charge. Every man should take control. If your wife is not doing well, it is your duty to cancel with her, to pray for her, to correct her. That's why you're the head. But in so many homes, I hear in Genesis chapter 3, verse 12. Again, let me read that verse before I go ahead. And the woman and the man said, The woman whom thou gavest to be with me. She gave me of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, Okay, let me leave that yet. I'm not coming to what he said to, to the woman. The woman you gave to be with me, God didn't say, God, God didn't say, did not know that the woman was the one that initiated this. Now, there are many men who are no longer in charge. There are many men who are no longer the head. There are many men who are not ahead. There are many men who have brought anarchy to the family. You are afraid of your wife, what she will do. That kind of relationship does not augur well for anybody. It's not biblical, it's not godly. 
And sister, when you have become so tough that you contend and contest everything with your husband, and you will not come into the place of submission, and you may have your several reasons. That's why ever before you wedded, we were warning you that, look, don't wed yet. Be sure that you know where you are going and what you are doing, and that you understand the purpose of God. There's no place that God is operating where he doesn't have a government. Somebody must be in charge. Somebody must be his direct agent. All of us are agent, but in a situation, that, that person must be his direct agent. And when the, that person loses his authority and influence, and it has happened in several homes where the man cannot talk, where the man is no longer in authority, where the man is afraid that if I say the truth, I will not sleep. So they rather keep quiet than speak up when they should speak up. Now, sister, that situation does not favor you as a woman. You will have to answer many questions when, when your husband is no longer able to answer questions. The woman you gave to be with me, she gave me. But Adam was the one God told, don't eat this tree. How can a woman now confuse you to do what God said you should not do? You are the one that told the woman what God said, and the woman came and confused you. Of course, he was not confused. The Bible said he rebelled. He, he, he disobeyed. So, God must help us. Friend, the word of God is forever settled. The word of God is final. The word of God is everything. If we want to succeed in life, we must order our lives and pattern our lives after what God said. And that is what we see in the Genesis. But by Genesis chapter 3, when, when the man disobeyed God and did what God said he would not do, the consequence, the consequence followed. God said, the day you shall eat of this, you will die. Now that death is not physical. The glory of God left and the human nature began to operate. Sin came in. Friend, and from Genesis chapter 3 onwards, you see a terrible catalog. And the last verse, the last sentence in the Old Testament is death. Death. Joseph was that Joseph died and he was put in a coffin inside Egypt. Human beings have learned how to do embalmment. They can, they can, they can, they can survive and they can hold death. That's how the Genesis. Be. That's how the Genesis. But even here, as I go on now, so thank God that I'm not pursuing any topic. We're just reading Bible. Let me read a little bit for you again. If you come to the book of Genesis, chapter three, I've just finished verse twelve, verse thirteen. And the Lord God said unto the woman. What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did it. And the Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field upon, upon thy belly thou shalt go, and on dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. Now put enmity between you and the woman, and between thy seed and his, her seed. He shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. Oh! It's wonderful to just read, but much better to study. And of course, we cannot study. We cannot take these uh, verses and tear them apart and see the inside and get a revelation. So just let's beg God to show us a few things that we must take to heart. Let him write it on our hearts. When the woman also, when, when the man could not answer God and pointed to his wife, that's why God spoke to his wife. If the man had answered God well, there was no need for 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 the woman to be asked parents must take responsibility for their homes god will not ask your children many questions if you answer those questions husbands must take responsibility for their wives brother we must learn to be in charge that is not to be autocratic no 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 but as you carry people along they must be made to stay under the word of god Otherwise, you just create an atmosphere where there's anarchy. And nothing goes well where there's confusion and disorder. Many children are misbehaving because their parents are not firmly in control. Every house must have its rules and regulations. Don't say that is legalism. No. Somebody must be in charge. There are some television programs and some videos and some CDs you cannot watch in my house. It's my house. There are some language that is abhorred in my house. It is my house. God has put me there and God is going to ask me. 
And I wouldn't be afraid to obey God and to do his will. He's going to ask me. I'm the person he put in charge. He gave me my wife to be my helper. And I'm, support, I'm supposed to teach her and make her to understand the way I'm working so that she will be carried along. And our children should be taught in the same manner so that the whole house is a place where God is in charge. I'm only a, I'm only a delegate. Uh, my, my purpose is to make sure that God's word and will is done in my home as it is done in heaven. Friend, when the woman said, it is the serpent, I mean, of course, that is our answer all the time. What happened? It is Satan. I'm asking somebody, I say, what I say? I don't know what happened to me. I don't know what happened to me. It is Satan. I say, no, that is not correct. You must take responsibility for your words, for your deeds, for your actions. Stop calling Satan. Satan is not so powerful that he compels you to do what you don't want to do. No. No. And even if he did, own up. Own up. Own up. What is this that thou has done? Sorry, Lord. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And God is merciful. But when you don't repent and say, the woman said, the serpent beguiled me. Brother, why did you sleep with a sister who is not your husband? He's Satan. That's the wrong answer. The correct answer is, Lord, I am sorry. I couldn't control myself. Please give me self-control. Help me out of this matter. And if the girl is pregnant, you don't abort it. You begin to buy milk and become a father, even if you are 15 years old, because you have done what fathers do. If you do what fathers do, you take responsibility as a father. You buy milk, you buy a napkin. Or some of you are now running away from a girl you're pregnant and you're telling her that you don't, you're not sure you are the one that pregnant her. And this kind of wickedness will return on your head. Every man reaps what he has sown. And if I were your father and you pregnant the girl, I would go and beg you to go and bring that girl home. Because there is no other thing to do except to marry her. Because you have married her by practice. Or at least that child comes home. You can't bring a child into the world and throw her away. No! That's wickedness and that is an evil in the society. So when the woman said, excuse me, it's Satan. So God faced Satan. And God didn't ask Satan, what did you do? The Satan did what he normally will do. Satan is evil. And he can't do good. So God is not asking him. So Satan, what, why did you confuse the woman? That is his job. Satan's job is to confuse you. Satan's job is to deceive you. Satan's job is to make you walk against God. So God didn't ask him because Satan will not repent. He's a tempter. He's a wicked man. He's malignant. His job is wickedness. His job is to oppose the purpose of God. His job is to cause the downfall of every man, like he caused it here. His job is to make you fail. Any method he wants to use, he will. So when the Bible, so the Bible says, now face Satan. Now face Satan. He said to stand, the Lord said unto, unto the serpent, because thou hast done this, you are cursed above all cattle. So number one, God cursed that snake. That serpent. Serpent is not Satan, but serpent Satan entered into serpent. And so we know serpent, we know Satan, Satan and serpent are synonymous somehow. When we talk about the old serpent, when we talk about the serpent, we're talking about the opposer of God, the Satan, the devil, the adversary. Eh? There are several names by which he goes. You see, you are cursed above every animal and above every beast of the field. Upon your belly shall thou go. That's the day God removed his legs and hands and he began to crawl on the sand. And thus shall thou eat all the days of your life. That's when God put him down forever to be a crawler. Satan is exquisitely a beautiful creation of God. When I see Satan on top of rock or stone, and I see the way, the, 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 the color and the, and the makeup, of, oh, Satan is exquisitely, fantastically made. If you met him in the Garden of Eden, he's not how he is today. What has caused him to come to this point? Even though we, even with this, he still looks, he still looks so, so beautiful. Is this, this, this God cursed him? And if you're under a curse, I beg you, I beg you, run back to God. Run back to God. Until the woman is, and, and I will put enmity between you and the woman. So God has put something between the devil and every human being. 
He said he has put a name. That's why whenever you see a snake, nobody tells you it's, 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 an, it's an action that is, is, is just is automatic. When I see a snake, either I run, I pick, a, I pick my slippers, I pick. It's, 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 God has put an enmity. If you like Satan, then you're on his side. But for everybody who knows what God has done, he has put enmity. Now that's critical. That's important. That whenever I see the enemy and his works, I get, I get offended because God has put a deep hatred between me and the devil, between, between the woman and, and, and the enemy. Hallelujah. And verse 15, and I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and the seed. So every woman, every man born by this woman is going to be at enmity with the devil, especially the seed. The seed is Jesus. Jesus is the seed. So now we are going to be discovering that God has already begun to bring a solution to the fall. And that solution is Jesus. The seed of the woman. He shall bruise your head and thou shalt bruise his heel. I want to stop here. This seed will bruise Satan's head. But Satan will only destroy his seed. So there is a consistent terrible warfare and struggle between human beings and the devil. Starting from Jesus. And everybody who is on the side of the Lord Jesus is having a terrible warfare with the devil. And the Bible said, Jesus, 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 the seed will bruise his seed. And all people who belong to Jesus will bruise his head. And that happened on the cross of Calvary. And all he could do was to bruise the leg of Jesus. Friend, where are you? Let me pray with you because our time is over. Are you giving an excuse? There's no need to give an excuse. Tell God sincerely what you have done. So that you can, you can, you can enter the company of the seed that will bruise his head. Come on the side of Jesus. Is the deliverer, is the savior, is the one that is the solution to the problem of the fall. You are falling so deep, but he can pull you out. He bruised his head on the cross of Calvary. The cross is the answer and the resurrection of Jesus. Put your faith in him, confess your sins, and God will deliver you right away. Father, I thank you because you are the solution, you have given us the solution. You say the seed of the woman, and this seed is the, is the Lord Jesus Christ. He will he bruise Satan's head on the cross and say it is finished. As many as are confessing their faults are no longer no longer calling somebody else and pointing to somebody else and say, I am the one that did it, Lord. Please, Lord, as they confess and look to Jesus on the cross and as he rose from the dead, please, Lord, receive them now and turn their situations and circumstances and bring them into reckoning and into the place of victory. In Jesus' name we pray.